Hello everybody, my name is Colin and I want to tell you a story. It's a story about a dream that came true with subtitles. <laughs> my story started in floating 17 years ago and when I thought about 17, and I heard Ash Khan this morning give his little poem, I realized I should have written a haiku for this morning. It's a poem with 17 syllables, uh, but I didn't. <laughs> the haiku that comes to mind when I think about Ash Khan um, as a butterfly may not be the image you all have, but it suits the haiku that comes to mind. Corn, down between the rows, weaving them together, a butterfly goes. So that's a little haiku. Now, 17 years ago, we started making float tanks in England, and we made all sorts of shapes and sizes. We made pod-type float tanks. We made round ones. We made square ones or rectangular ones. And we made specials for people who wanted something a little bit different. But then uh, the story that I really want to tell you today began three years ago, almost exactly to the day because it was at the conference in Portland. We come from England, but our floating home is here in Portland. And at Portland three years ago, I met Dr. Justin Feinstein for the first time. And Justin had a dream. And we met, and he said to me, Colin, I have a dream. I want to use flotation for research. I think the float tanks should be round. I think there should be an open one and there should be a closed one. And there should be all sorts of special features that I haven't even thought about yet. Could you do that for me? And I said, yes. <laughs> And that is how we began for the float tanks at Liber. And Justin's dream began to look like this. It's a facility in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oklahoma is a great place for it to be because Dr. J. Shirley it was in Oklahoma City who actually was the first scientist to start using flotation to examine what happens in our minds. And here at the Liber Center, you see we have a, quite a big facility with a reception room, an open round uh, float pool for introduction, a central area for all the researchers to actually sit and do whatever they do, and a closed float tank, a round one, eight foot diameter uh, for some of the experiments. And that dream came true. We had to up our act as float tank manufacturers because Justin wanted the float experience to be as near perfect as he could achieve. So we had to have tighter calibration of the variables than we 
would normally expect to do. And in particular, we had to look at the air, which I think Jim mentioned. In the early days, we only worried about the float tank solution, the water, the Epsom salt, but of course the air that you're breathing is absolutely essential part of the experience of relaxation and the invisibility of the experience that you become unaware of your environment. Obviously, uh, we had to look after the water. So, uh, it's controlled, but like uh, all flotation systems, it has to be accurately controlled. We added water with an accurate level system to about one millimeter using reverse osmosis filtration. We have sterilization, or I should say disinfection is the correct word, by UV and hydrogen peroxide. We have the Epsom salt, and we maintain the specific gravity at around 1.26, which is ideal for floating. But what's more important is to concentrate on the air. The air temperature should be as close as possible to the water temperature. And controlling it, as has been said before, is actually more difficult than controlling the water temperature, especially since you want to achieve a relative humidity of 80%. That's the right target. If you have a humidity higher than 80%, you will tend to make it stuffy and you'll get condensation, which is a problem we don't want to have. And if the humidity drops much below 80%, when you're floating, the salt begins to crystallize around your body and uh, you start to feel it. So 80% and at the same temperature of the water is quite difficult to achieve. So, in the open pool, it's done by air conditioning system. And in the closed pool, we have a progressive system. And this, this is part of the, the dream uh, diagram that has become reality. At the top of the diagram, you see there's a tube where we actually extract air with a fan a long way away. And the air that goes in starts in the green box, which is a HEPA filter, taking away particles. And then we humidify the air with a, a, basically a steam box, which is under uh, individual control, of course. And then the black box is, we call it the hot box. It, it, it heats the air. And the whole thing is controlled so that we put into that, into that big round float tank air at the right temperature, just uh, the same or slightly higher. It's amazing when you when you feel a breeze coming in, uh, the air feels colder, so you, we actually have the temperature sometimes a little higher. And so that's the length we had to go to, which we wouldn't normally do on a commercial system, but it's possibly the way that we should go. And we added a data logging system, which runs through the internet. So these graphs that you can see here, these, this is a 24-hour record as it happens. They're continuous. We can look at these from anywhere in the world, and in particular, Justin can stay up all night looking at them to see what's going on. And you, I'm not going to explain every detail because that's not the point. The point is that we can see what's going on. In this, in this graph you see here, the peaks are caused by actually the, there's a probe on the actual heater. The heater gets much hotter than the rest of the system, of course. The green line is the pump, as a matter of fact. The pump is regularly going through the day. You can, in this case, you see there wasn't much of a float session going on. The pump was running intermittently, and it rises. But the steady lines at the bottom are showing that the air and the water are pretty much at the same temperature. And the bottom of the, pro, of the graph is the humidity, and the humidity, I don't know if you can see the values, but that's hanging around 80% all the time. In the open pool, uh, we have a slightly different set of variables. And you can see here that uh, where, the, where the peaks come in, that's where the heater turns on, that will be the door opening. So the, the room cools down a little bit, the heaters have to compensate. There's a huge gain, of course, because where you see the blue arrow, 
the temperature of the air and the temperature of the water are the same, more or less, and they're running through absolutely steady. And the point about doing this uh, data logging, which is, again, a very a f a feature for the future, is that we can check all kinds of parameters, and we learned a lot from watching what happens over the long term. Now, noise reduction. We have three causes of noise. Airborne noise is obvious. Groundborne noise, noise is what comes through the floor, and there's heater and ticking noise. Now, what we did, we found that the hospital has an MRI machine. It's not a noisy building, normally speaking, but an MRI machine is very noisy. And when you were floating, you could hear it. So we had to put the float tanks on springs. This is a diagram showing a float tank mounted on the heater, which is continuous heating, of course, and then mounted on rubber springs. And this is what happens. This is a, a video running with a float tank loaded to the right mass, mounted on exactly the kind of springs. And here we see, we're exciting it with a little motorized drill. And you, we're using an iPad, one of these, very useful, with an app called Vibrations. And that helps see what that experiment just showed. The left-hand one is mounted on the floor, being excited by a rather gross vibration. And that's what happens when you're at the float tank, when it's mounted on springs. The ticking, you know, there's a bit of a rumor going around that if you have a fiberglass tank and you put heaters underneath it, then you're doomed to have ticking. And there's obviously truth in the rumor, but you don't have to have it. Uh, we experienced some ticking when everything was really quiet and we dealt with it and it doesn't tick. It's a question of putting the right technology in place. So that is the way that Justin's dream of a research facility using flotation came true. And after the break, you will hear uh, Justin himself explaining what he did. What we did as technologists was produce a float tank system that could be used for clinical research, that we can monitor all the variables uh, using an internet-connected data logger, and that you can control things like the lights by waving at them. A little detail, it may just be a gimmick, but we were quite pleased with it. <laughs> um, my time is up. That's the end of my story. We made a dream come true. And I hope our technology can make all your dreams come true. And floating can expand all over the world. Thank you for listening.